We're going to be talking about just lock. In Proverbs 22, verse 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor in life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the fraud, which means perverted. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I just wanted you to understand that. Uh, obviously, America is not doing that, but let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, about them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. And though covetousness, and through covetousness, shall they feign words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them is seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And of course, uh, the Corinthian letter, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that uh, all temptation are common to men, but God will make a way that you can be, uh, you know, I don't want to misquote that. I'm going to read it to you. In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, because it's a good verse, I don't want to misquote that. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as, uh, as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that he may be able to bear it. Okay, now I want you to go to Romans 15. I'm just, there's going to be quite a bit of just reading and uh conversation here Romans 15 4 for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that through we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope and patience and comfort together in one verse uh, a lot of people don't have much patience and they don't understand how that patience and comfort could uh, be good well it's patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope so well, so we're things are written four times. So go to Genesis 11, and let's see if we can collect some thoughts about this just man, Lot. Okay. Now, the question is, who is Lot? I mean, you don't hear a lot about him. I uh, heard a preacher saying, as in the days of Lot. And, uh, of course, the angels came in, and we'll talk about that, and took Lot and his wife and his two daughters out and that's not all that he had he had a sons sons-in-law and daughters and whatever but <clears throat> let's see who lot is in connection with reading all right in verse 27 genesis 11 27 we've got to get the genealogy okay now these are the generations of Terah. now Terah is the father of abram abraham okay Terah begat abram this is before Abraham's name is changed, which his name is changed, I believe, in uh, uh, Acts 17. 
Yes, and it'll be changed to Abraham. But while we're reading, it'll be Abram, if you allow me. Okay, Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Those are, uh, Haran are the, the brothers, the brothers of uh, born of Terah. And Haran, and he brings it right up at the end before he even gives the genealogy of Abram, Nahor, he brings up Haran. And the reason is Haran begot Lot. So Lot's father is, is Haran. The problem with Haran is he died, uh, verse 28. Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity in the Earl of Chaldees. And that's where they were born and raised in the Earl of Chaldees. Okay, and uh, verse 29, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. Now get this genealogy. The name of Abram's wife is Sarai. We know that name is changed to Sarah later when Abraham's name is changed. And the name of Nahor's wife is Milcah, and Milcah is the daughter of Haran. So he marries his uh, niece, uh, obviously, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishkar. That's who Haran was. And of course, he died, all right? 36, but Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abraham, Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran's, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from the Earl of Chaldees unto the land of Canaan, and this is going to be considered Hebron, okay, Hebron, where you get the name Hebrew with Abraham, and we'll see that in a minute. Verse 32, the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Herod, and they had probably named the place where they settled down as inherent in respect to their of uh, Tira's son who died, which was Lot's father. Okay. Genesis 12, we use a lot in teaching of the blessing of verse three. Uh, he said to Abram, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Twofold thing, uh, if you blessed Israel, uh, the seed of Abram, which would be Abraham later, his uh, his son Isaac, and then Jacob. Uh, if a person blessed out those that seed through the twelve tribes, Jacob being named Israel, they would be blessed, and if they didn't, they would curse. Whatever. Then the other part of the message is, and in thee all families of the earth be blessed. That's the mystery of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to the earth living and then being rejected of Israel and dying and rising. And Paul brings this up that the blessing there would be the spirit of Christ being given to a believer. Now let's go on and, and how, how would that be? Christ would, the message given to Paul would Christ died for our sins according to scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture. And according to the scripture, you just read it right here. Uh, and in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. Turn that down. We got to come right back. But I want you to turn to Galatians chapter three. The first time I ever read this, uh, me and another friend of mine were reading through the Bible. We were working eight hours a day and then reading and we were going to preacher's classes and whatever with Brother Moore. But in Galatians 3 eight, and the scripture, not scriptures and the scripture, this is the the God-breathed inspiration, uh, the scripture, uh, it would be God Almighty himself, the Lord, the word, the scripture, okay? When he breathed, inspired, then it was written down, it became scriptures, but here, and the scripture foreseeing, that's the ability of God to foresee from Genesis to Revelation, the ability to God to know what was going to happen, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. And that's what you read in Genesis 12, the last part of that verse. That was the mystery that if Christ died, was buried, and rose again, a person that was to hear the message of Paul, the gospel of Christ, if he trusts it, trusts what he believed, he's sealed with that Holy Spirit promise, which the mystery was that God would give the spirit to believers. The devil didn't know that. 
he thought it was all through Israel him, themselves, blessing Israel or, uh, and so forth, and getting people to curse Israel. He, he loved that, of course, and uh, tried to get Balaam and Balak in that situation. You, you just have to read the Old Testament about this stuff. But it's not about blessing Israel, and it's not about cursing Israel. It is about trusting the gospel of your salvation in whom God will give you, he'll seal you with that Holy Spirit promise. Now, go back to Genesis 12. That is not all that's in Genesis 12. Let's begin in verse 4, Genesis 12, 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Herod. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance. So as we read this, you understand that Lot's pretty important to stay in the under the wing of Abraham. And they went forth into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Okay. Now, look with me. Uh, verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And they build an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So, the promise of the land is given to Abram. And that has not ceased. That is a promise of God that will never fail. And it is Israel because in Abram is his seed. And his seed is based on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Jacob's name is changed to Israel, the 12 tribes. They're going to get the land. Thus, Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. There is no doubt the inheritors of the earth is the seed of Abraham. Okay. Now, chapter 13 begins in one. Abram went up out of Egypt and he and his wife and all he had and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. Okay. Now turn down, uh, go down with me to verse five. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. And there, and you'll find, and we can't read all this, I realize in the time we have, but you realize that while they're together, their substance is so much, and this is the blessing of, of God, no doubt, is so much that the uh, herdsmen are fighting and struggling together against each other because of the water, no doubt, or, and things that are whatever else. And so it comes to a point, Abram does not want a dispute with Lot. That's, And I'm going to show you that he calls Lot his son. Now, keep that in mind because it was his brother's son. But he calls him his son, and we'll look at that in just a minute. And uh, understand, it's not a. Uh, I've heard people say, "Well, there you go. You found in the King James a discrepancy in uh, descriptions because that is his son, uh, his his brother's son." But let's just read on and watch. He don't want to have any dispute, so he said, "We're going to have to choose. We're going to have to go away from each other." And so he said, "You look." In whatever direction you want and go, and whatever direction you go, I'll go the other. Okay, so Lot makes the bad decision, uh, verse 11. Then Lot chose all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot put, dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Okay. Bad mistake. Okay. Verse 13, 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now you take people and they say, well, Lot knew where he was going. Maybe he's a funny guy or something. I mean, you get all kinds of things that people pull from the scripture. No, he just chose this, but it was a wrong choice. And I, I want you to understand as we read this, so many people today are making the wrong choice by eyesight. No doubt the planes may have looked good. Uh, might have had a lot of stuff, water and everything. I don't know that, that stuff between Lot and his mental 
capacity in God, whatever. But so many people choose a good looking church or a good looking preacher or a good looking assembly or a good looking this or that. And uh, a lot of churches are built on beautiful pieces of property. And so people are drawn to that because it's so beautiful and, and uh, serene and all that. And it's eyesight. You understand it's eyesight. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's quite obvious. And so Sodom is a bad place. I mean, it's a bad place. Now let's see what God does with Abram. Verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was uh, separated from him, lift up thine eyes, look from the place where thou art northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever, forever. So they're going to get it. They're not in the they're not in the market of the land right now. They're in a fallen state, cast away. But it's coming, and they will get it. And uh, there's things that we have to understand in Scripture, and hope I can get them over to you of why it took so long and whatever. But now look with me in verse 18. Then Abram removed his tent, came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar of the Lord. And that's where we get Hebron, uh, Hebrews, okay? And if you want to see the word Hebrew, uh, look with me in verse 13, chapter 14, Genesis 14, 13. And it came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew. So we're okay. We're on, we're on level ground here. Hebron is Hebrew. Abram is the Hebrew. Okay. And uh, we go down to verse 1, chapter 14, Genesis 14, 1. And it came to pass in the days of, uh, and I, and I, for sake, I mispronounced the, the kings and whatever. These kings, in verse 2, that made war with Berea, king of Sodom, and with Bersia, king of Gomorrah. So there's a battle going on. Sodom and Gomorrah's kings, okay, are being fought against. And it's not going good. So in verse 8, there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Admir and the king of Zeborah and the king of Berea, Belia, the same, the same as Zorah. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Shittim, of Shittim. And the Chaldemar, the king of Elam, and it goes on the kings. There's a veil in verse 10. The veil of, of Siddam was full of slime pits. And the king Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. Okay. Now, the battle didn't go good. So you have the king of verse 9 took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and, and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Okay, so again, we're this is centering around Lot and Abram. And so they took Lot and his stuff. And verse 13, there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Echol, Eschol, brother of Aner. And these are confederate with Abram. So these are the friends of Abraham. The others were the opposite. Okay. And when Abram heard that his brother, uh, I, you know, I said a while ago, his son, his brother, I apologize. And I do correct that. I said, son, his Abram calls. Law, his brother, in place of Haram, his brother that died. He said, he, uh, Abram heard that his brother was taken captive. He armed and trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, and he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobath, which is in the left uh, hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot. Again, he says he calls him brother. 
and his goods and the women also and the people. And by the way, it is not anything wrong when I call <clears throat> believers on Zoom, my brothers, even though we're not kin, we're brothers in the Lord. And Abram considers Lot his brother instead of his brother that died, he lost his brother. So he considers him his brother. Okay, now watch. He said in, uh, <clears throat> he brought back all his good, all the goods. He also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom, now this is a new king, no doubt took place of the ones that died in the slime pit. And the king of Sodom went, uh, Sodom, Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of, of the king there and the kings that were with him in the valley of Sheba, which is uh, King's Dale, and Melchizedek. Now here shows up Melchizedek. So you see, we got Abram, or Abram, Lot. We've got Melchizedek. I mean, these are important people in the Bible. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth wine, bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, okay? And the king of Salem is, is uh, uh, that's what he's called. He's called the king of Salem. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram the most high, of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thy enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Okay. Abraham gave tithes of all. Somebody said, it sounded like Melchizedek gave tithes. No. Abraham, Abram gave tithes of all. Now let's see what it is. Turn to Hebrews chapter seven. You always got to compare things to understand what's going on. Okay. In Hebrews seven, verse four. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. When I was young, it always preached that Abraham gave a tenth all he had. It has nothing to do with that. Tithes were given to the priests. And Abram gave a tenth of the spoils that he got in the battle, delivering his brother Lot. And so he gave a tenth of all. And the king of Sodom, said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Abraham don't want the goods. He gave a tenth because of the Lord and his delivery of his brother Lot. But he don't want the spoils. And all he really wants is he said, give my people that fought with me their uh, portion. But I don't want anything because he said in verse uh, 22 Abram said to the king of Sodom I've lifted up my hand to the Lord the most high God the possessor of heaven and earth I will not take from a thread even to the shoe latch and that I will not take anything that is thine lest thou should say I've made Abram rich Abraham was rich God had blessed him thoroughly so rich that him and Lot had had to separate but Lot didn't go into, or Abram didn't go into this battle to get rich. And he don't need to be more rich, he thinks. He'd rather serve the Lord. And he says in verse uh, 24, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of men which went with me, Aner, Eshkol, Mamre, let them take their portions. Abram don't want it. But he gave a tenth of it first, first and foremost to Melchizedek as an offering to the Lord. And you see, you learn something about Abraham's not a greedy person and he's not a lover of money. He's blessed by the Lord and he takes care of that blessing in the fact that the Lord let him go in and get his brother. He gives a tenth of it to the Lord. And, and don't let nobody fool you. Abraham didn't give a tenth of all he had. He never said that in the Bible. It said a tenth of the spoil. So we learned something from that. Okay. Now, I want you to go over to chapter 17, verse 1. 
And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am Almighty God, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make a high covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thou call thy name any more. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of thee. Kings shall come out of thee. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land. Again, you all you have to do is read the Bible and find out who's going to get the earth. When all everything, all the dust is settled and when God is done with doing all the prophecy and all the things he's told about, such in Matthew 24 and 25 and and all the things of Hebrews through Revelation. When you see, when all that stuff happens, the end result is Israel's going to get the land. That's the promise to Abraham. And the God of this world knew that. And so forth and so on. And God said in that verse 9, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. And this is my covenant. I guess we're going to learn which you shall keep between me and you, thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. That's what Paul emphasizes in Philippians chapter 3. Circumcise the eighth day. Thus he is part of Israel. He's not a heathen. He's not set aside. He's not set out. All right. Every man child in your generation, either is born in the house or bought with money or any uh, uh, money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be with your flesh and for an everlasting covenant. And this and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, thou soul shall be cut off from his people he has broken my covenant. Plain as day. You, all preachers have had to do is go back and read this. So circumcision is the issue. Acts chapter 2, circumcision is the issue. Acts chapter 10, Peter, the issue of circumcision is the issue. Uh, Acts cha uh, Philippians chapter 3, circumcised the uh, eighth day. Uh, Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, called uncircumcision. That means they were... Israel wouldn't consider the Ephesians part of any promises of God, and yet by grace they were saved. And we'll get to that in just a minute. All right. Now, uh, here Sarah's name changed uh, in Genesis uh, 17, five, uh, 15. Her name is changed to Sarah, uh, to Sarah, and she get, gets a son. And, and, and I ain't got time to, but. Here's what I want to go to, Acts 8, Genesis 18. Let's, let's start here. We're studying Lot, so you can read all about Abraham, Sarah, Ishmael, Isaac, on so forth, but let's find out something about Lot. Okay, <clears throat> Genesis 18, 1. And the Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood with him by him. Okay, now this men issue, they look like men, you would think they're men, but they are angels, and one of them appears to be the Lord, because when you get to Genesis 19, there are two angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord sent them. In verse chapter 18, the Lord is with these two angels. It comes to him, Abraham. They stood by him. Now you watch this thing. Look in verse eight. He took butter and milk, calf which he dressed, set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Okay? Look in 19, chapter 19, verse 3. In 19, 3. 
This is when the angels are in Sodom. Okay. Uh, verse 3. And he pressed upon them greatly. They turned in unto him. And he entered into the and, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did break uh did break unleavened bread, and they did eat. I just want to bring out a feet. Angels can eat. And that isn't all about angels. There are some incredible things about this. Turn to Second Peter. Turn to Second Peter. Chapter 2, verse 7. I think there's another verse I'm looking for. Um, I don't want that right now. I apologize. I want you to go back with me to second uh, Genesis 18. I'll get that in just a second. All right, in Genesis 18, they're there to explain to Abraham about the child with Sarah. And of course, this is where you see the laughing. Now look within verse 14. This is what I want in verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. I want to emphasize this verse to you in the sense of, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Uh, hold this just a minute and turn to Isaiah chapter 55. So many times we doubt that the Lord's going to do it. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing wherein I send it. The word of the Lord will never fail. Sarah and Abram both laughed and they were mainly shown they laughed and Sarah denied it. And the Lord said, uh, you did laugh. And verse 14, is anything, and this is Genesis 18 again, is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Okay. Now what they're going to do from here is they're headed for Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abram has, Abraham has no idea about this. And so, verse 16. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children. There it is. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he gets old and not far. I know he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said. Because the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is, come unto me, and if not, I will know. I can't help but think about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word, came to earth to see. And what he saw, the Bible says Jesus wept. He wept for the unbeliever. And yet, in all the things he saw and had done to him, when he came on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he died. And he had saw in the garden 
what he dreaded, horrible thing he saw of going into hell. And in hell, three days, there came a time when the Lord said, they're forgiven. Come up, son. And he came up and he led us to the Father and presented us holy and without blame before him in love. And the day came when we that have been presented to the Lord had our day when the Lord preached to us. And if you've forgotten that day, you might be a little bit like Lot. Now, let's go on. I just want to put that in your mind. Okay. And uh, verse 30, uh, 22. And the men turned their face from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood, Abraham stood before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he, he, he goes down and talk, talks down from uh, 50 to 20 to 10 or, or 30. Finally, uh, he comes down to 10's sake. And he says, If you can find 10 righteous men there, will you save it? And in the verse 33, the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now, 19, Genesis 19, and there came two angels. Remember, there's three over there in Acts, uh, Genesis 18 with Abraham. Now there's two, the Lord sent them, and the uh, sent, uh, Verse 13, Genesis 19, 13. For we will destroy this place because the city of the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy. So that's not a contradiction. There was three, then there was two. And like in Daniel, there was four, but there was three. And on and on, well, here's two angels are sent by the Lord, and they're called lords being angels. Now that gives me a reference thinking of, of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, when the Lord appeared to him, he didn't know who he was, but he called him Lord because he figured only an angel could do what he did to him, blinded him with the, with the light. So it is, people can call on a Lord and not know who he is. You understand? Well, a uh, lot here uh, calls them my Lord. Okay, now there's something I want you to see in Second Peter about this man Lot. Turn to Second Peter. Again, we read it a while ago. Let's look at this. Verse 7, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He's at outside uh, here. And he he's just I mean, he's a very unhappy man. There's no doubt. I, I think about Romans 8. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together and down. And not only they, but we also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We live in a world that's getting, and it appears very evil, but it's always been evil, but it's getting worse. And it's, it's telling us that 2 Timothy 3 is true. Uh, Go to 2 Timothy 3 and watch. And this is the warning to uh, Timothy from Paul of what had happened in the last uh, days of grace. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. One of the things that I considered is why wouldn't people come to Bible study? Because, and why don't people have friends? Because they're lovers of their own selves. They like their company, their company, or the ones that are likened to them better than being friends with people. Okay? Um, he says, lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. The disobedient to uh, uh, parents goes back to that Proverbs where we're reading, train up a child in the way you should go. 
goes back to things we learned from reading the Old Testament, how that um, uh, Ha Finney, I Finney, I, and uh, Eli, Eli the high priest, had gotten fat. Priests wouldn't get fat on God's uh, giving them their food to eat. He would know how to keep them in tip top shape. But the sons of Eli were trained right and they were bringing women near or in the temple or in the tabernacle or uh, it'd be the, the temple or whatever. And uh, well, I, I'll just cancel that and say holy place. Let's do it that way. Be safe because my memory escaped me right then. Uh, in the holy place, bringing women, strange women in there and all that, doing wrong. And they landed up all three of them dead. And it's like Saul, King Saul, conjuring up Samuel to have a knowledge of what was coming. He didn't want to know because Samuel said, well, you and your son are going to die. I mean, it'd be better to look at the scripture and understand what's in the future than trying to get somebody to show you something that maybe you don't want to hear. And that's the problem with people. And that's what's wrong with the devil on this thing. He don't want to hear what's coming. He knows by reading. He knows the scriptures. He don't want to know that the tribulation is coming. He don't want to know that he's going to be in the bottom of the pit and in the lake of fire. He don't want to know that. He, he don't want it to come. So he tries to develop an army that can defeat the army of God. And he can't even with his angels defeat Michael in Revelation 12. And so he's angry about that in Revelation 12, which is the middle of the tribulation. The wicked one comes down the earth and you don't want to be here. And God in his mercy and his grace saved you from that. If you'll just trust him, is there anything too hard with the Lord? All right. Now he says, Blasphemer, disobedient, parent, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, despise, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure, more, <clears throat> more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power there from such turn away. Oh my gosh, the last days are looking just like that for us. But is, the, is anything too hard for the Lord? Did the Lord see a day? of redemption uh look in uh, ephesians chapter four in ephesians four verse 30 grieve not the holy spirit of god well go to galatians 5 and read the fruit of the spirit and and don't grieve it verse 22 that the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness don't grieve that Holy Spirit promise. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit promise, whereby you're sealed into the day of redemption. Let the fruit of the Spirit work. You're sealed into the day of redemption. So there's a day that you'll be redeemed because you had that redemption in that seal. And so, again, rejoice, be happy, but be a witness. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And any day could be the catch out. I mean, we all talk about that, but you didn't get up this morning and think, well, this is a catch out. But any day could be the catch out. It's like Isaiah 7, verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now you should be called Emmanuel. Mary didn't get up the morning that she was going to go see her cousin Elizabeth and say, oh my God, today. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon me and I'm going to conceive. She had no idea. We have no idea when the day of redemption is. We just know there's a day of redemption. Thus, if we know there's a day of redemption, we press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And every day is a day when we trust the Lord for this day. Then the next day, and the day after. And if it be the Lord's pleasure, we leave. Now, Ephesians said, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed into the day of redemption. All right. Now go back with me to Genesis chapter 19. And <clears throat> the two angels in Sodom don't want to come in the house. Now, I'm not 
going to say any more about that much. I've heard it said that things were not good in Lot's house. But I'm not going to say what's in Lot's house. I'm just saying they were going to abide in the street all night. Now, there ain't nobody going to bother them. You understand. Until they get in Lot's house. Now, maybe you ought to think about that. Verse 3, and he pressed in upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. There you are, the angels eat. And the Bible says, beware, be careful, because sometime in your life, you may entertain angels. And I told Kathy this morning, I said, you know, you never know who's eating with you. Might be a stranger. We had a deal happened in Tuscaloosa many years ago. We went to Bible camp from Arkansas. We didn't have any money. We had three little kids and we were going to Bible camp. Old cars, rusty and everything else. But we were going because we wanted to go to a fellowship and Bible class in the, in the camp. We made way. We made a way. You understand that's the trouble, people. You don't make a way to go. You you make excuses. You don't make a way. You make excuses, and that's the problem with humans. And we made a way, and we went, and we didn't have the money, and we went to uh, Wendy's uh, or Hardee's or somewhere to get breakfast, and we didn't have the money enough, so we went to McDonald's. And back then, you could get a pretty cheap meal at McDonald's, and so we went inside and. The car wasn't even locked. Wasn't no need because you could reach through the rust and unlock the hitch, the uh, uh, the tumbler thing or the rod. And I went, I said, okay, order what you want for you and the kids and me. And I'm, I've got to use the restroom. And I went to the restroom. I come back. Kathy's looking at me and she just handed me a piece of paper. And she said, read that. And I said, what is it? And I unfolded and it said, uh, in Jesus' name, God bless you. And there's a $20 bill. And I said, who gave you this? And she said, I'm not really sure. I never turned around. He just reached around and handled me. And all I saw was his backside as he's leaving. He said, your car wasn't locked. And I was afraid somebody was going to steal this. It wasn't in my car. And we wondered all these years, who was that? We don't know. But you know what? It doesn't matter. The $20 got us to Bible camp. And then... From Bible camp, people gave us money and gave us things, which, hey, when we left, we got home, we paid bills. Used to, when I went to Bible conferences, and back when Brother Moore and them were alive, people gave you money at the conferences for your trip and for to help you out. They don't do that much anymore. I wonder why. What's happened in times? Times have gotten uh, changing people, I guess. But um, the the idea was you never know who you're entertaining. So be just be careful. You never know who you're talking about. So just be careful. I had to face that all the time because sometimes I get road rage and I get things about me. Be careful who you're entertaining because they can appear any form way they want to. Now, he said uh, they wouldn't go in. Finally, they did. They went in and ate with him. And as they're in the house, the men of Sodom, young and old, came and they wanted to know these men because no doubt they're beautiful. And they're homosexuals. They're sodomites. And Lot says, I mean, Lot is a just man. And it sounds like it's this is horrible what he does. He says, uh, Lot, verse 6, and Lot went out to the door under them and shut the door after them and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray thee, bring them out unto you and do, uh, uh, do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for there, therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Sounds like he's, he's compromising or whatever. No, we don't own anything. 
And a lot of times people have something and want to give it to somebody else or sell it to somebody else. And what's funny is they don't want you to do anything with it like it ain't yours to them. Folks, if I sell you something, it's yours. You do whatever you want. If you want to burn it right in front of me, I don't care because it was supposed to be given to you. However, form of selling, gift, whatever. These girls were given to him of the Lord. This is just Lot. Remember, his name's Just. And he, in his righteous act, was willing to sacrifice them to keep this wickedness from those under his house. I, I don't know if I can, I, I fail you. I, I know I fail you. To keep the wickedness out of his house, he was he was willing to sacrifice. That That's what it's about, folks. To keep the wickedness out of your house, you're willing to sacrifice what you want or what you lust after or what you covet to keep the wickedness out of your house. And the angels, man, they just reached in there, grabbed him, pulled him in and shut the door and blinded them dudes. I mean, there ain't no problem with the whole thing. The angels can take care of whatever they want to take care of anyway. They blinded them. And these people are still trying to find the door. And the time come the angel said, take you, if you got any of your house, don't tell them. So Lot went and told his sons-in-law and, and uh, the uh, daughters that they need to get out of this place. Verse 13, for we will destroy this place because the city, the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. That's the Lord one of the angels that were with Abraham sent the two angels that were with him. And verse 14, Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters and said, up, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemeth as one that mocked his sons-in-law. You understand? That's how you feel sometimes when you deal with your saved one, uh, your uh, kinfolk. They mock you. They make fun of you because you tell them the truth. Well, guess what? You tell them the truth and they mock you. They're going to get what they want. And so they stayed. They stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah. And there was Lot, his wife, and two daughters left. They took them out. And I'm going to read in verse 17. 18 and 19 now on down so we all get an understanding here but nowhere could i find that it said that if you turn back and look you'll become a pillar of salt it happened what they said was verse 15 and when the morning rose uh, then the angels hastened lot saying arise take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. We know that in verse 26, the wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. That is in Luke 17, 32. Matter of fact, get, get Luke 17. You get taught a lot of things, but it's not necessarily exactly what it is. In Luke 17, verse 32, remember Lot's wife now what's that about verse 29 and the same day that lot went out of sodom it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all even thus shall it be in the days when the son of man is revealed in that day he shall be upon the housetop he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house let him not come down to take it away and he that is in the field let him likewise not return back remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And that's the doctrine that the Lord taught him in Matthew 24 about the tribulation and about the things running away and whatever. And why did Lot's wife look back? Because she liked the things she has. We all like the things we have, but they're not as important 
as salvation for someone else. I can tell you that right now. Our purpose and reason for being in this life, if we're saved, we're a witness. And our witness is more important than the things we have. That's that sacrifice of Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3. That is the thing about uh, looking back. Don't look back. Look forward. Press towards the mark for the prize of high calling. Set your affections on things above. It just goes on and on. But now let's read on. Now here's what I want to talk about. Verse 17. It came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Doubting the salvation of the Lord. I, I want you to see that. The man has been... He'd been jerked out of Sodom and Gomorrah and told to go to the mountain. And he don't want to. He don't want to. I thought about many times when I was in the studio of Brother Morris doing my work. And the Lord began to deal with me on going to Arkansas and began a Bible study. I didn't want to go. You see, we as humans don't want to go and do what God says. Are you afraid to read Romans through Philemon a lot and see what God really wants you to do? Are you afraid to do what God moves you to do? Are you cheerful on a lot of things? Or are you belligerent and hold back because it might not profit you? It might cost you. I can't go to the mountain. I might die. Behold, verse 20. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will overthrow this, uh, I will not overthrow this city for that which thou hast spoken. Just lot. He argued with the Lord. He supplicated with the Lord. And the Lord said, All right, you can go to this city. Now, remember, therefore the name of the city was Zoar. And the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained Sodom and Gomorrah upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord of the heaven, uh, Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all plains, all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the city and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him. And she became a pillar of salt. And like I said, it doesn't say that the angel said that. It's something that happened. Okay. Abram got the up early, got up early in the morning before the play, uh, in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot, which Lot dwelt. Again, we are remembered by the Lord for Christ's sake. Abraham representing the thought of Christ. Christ went to hell and rose, justified us, glorified us, redeemed us. And God remembers us when the day that the wrath is going to be poured out on the earth. He remembers us and he redeems us from it. A lot of people argue with this redemption power. They argue with the power of the resurrection that Paul knew. And they think that they still need to confess sins or they need to walk the aisle or ask Jesus in the heart or join a church. And they argue with him. And it doesn't work, folks. It doesn't work. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. We can trust the Lord 
and what he did and always remember there is nothing too hard for the Lord. All right, now watch. And <clears throat> they're uh, 30. Lot left the safety of Zoar and went into the mountain where he didn't want to go and dwelled in a cave. And the end results was his two daughters thought that the end of the world had come. And they got their father drunk, each one of them, and became pregnant and had two of the worst things come because Lot did not teach them in the sense that God and nothing too hard will we'll go on. It'll be all right. We we'll stay in Zohar until the Lord tells us to leave. No, they left went into cave and they caused this act of the Moabites and the Amorites and I ain't got time in, in the class but you look at the things but I will look at one thing look in Deuteronomy uh, let's see if it's the one I'm thinking about Deuteronomy 23 yes Deuteronomy 23 Verse 1, he that is wounded in the stones or hath a private member cut off shall not enter in the congregation of the Lord. A bastard shall not enter in the congregation of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation shall he not enter in the congregation of the Lord. And an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter in the generation of the Lord forever. Wow. <clears throat> the act of the girls with Lot brought forth people that would be a a curse against Israel and they can't enter it. Now watch. First Timothy. First Timothy. It wouldn't matter if you are of the tribe of Ammon or Moabites or anybody else. In First Timothy 2.4 Verse 3, God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God don't care what your tribe is. God don't care where you came from. God don't care what color, color your skin is. And he don't care what you've done in this world. He made provision of salvation and it's his will for you to be saved. How can you be saved? You can trust the gospel of your salvation and believe be sealed unto a day of redemption people don't see that I didn't know much about how to go about with Lot because he is an important person in the Bible but we understand he's a human and things happen God's will for all of us right now is to be saved so he changed it from no more by so I mean I should be in the congregation of the Lord to all men can be in the house of the Lord. We've been brought into the household of God by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was the mystery in Genesis 12, in these shall all families earth be blessed. Amen. 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 Thank you.